Well, we're still on thermal chemistry, but now we're on section 6.5, which is called calorimetry. Now, calorimetry, you might have heard of a calorimeter or something like that, that is used to determine the number of calories in a substance. Now, the calories in a substance that you may be used to hearing about are the calories in food. Now, in our situation, we can use a calorimeter to determine the amount of calories in food and how that normally is done in what's called a bomb calorimeter. And a bomb calorimeter, you put your cookie down in here and you light it on fire and then you determine the, how hot, how much energy was given off by the temperature change. And you can backtrack that to per gram of cookie. I guess there's labs all over the country that their sole goal in life is to determine the amount of calories in foods. And so you can have it on uh, the package. Now that's called a bomb calorimeter and a bomb calorimeter is constant volume. A, pre a constant pressure calorimeter or like these called styrofoam cup calorimeters or just a cup calorimeter where you have a reaction occurring in an aqueous solution. So the water is the matrix where the reaction is occurring and that, and because of that, and you know, knowing things about water, you can determine how, by the change in temperature, how much energy the water absorbed. And if you know how much energy the water absorbed or lost, you can then determine how much energy the chemical reaction absorbed or lost. So these are pictures out of your book. So we'll go through some examples on how we use that in, cal in uh, thermochemistry. So before we can, before we continue and actually be able to use it, we have to have some definitions. And one of those definitions is specific heat. Uh, the specific heat of a substance is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of the substance by one degree Celsius. So temperature and heat is kind of like, you know, you don't really know it's there until it changes. Or just like when we, you're kind of walking around, oh, it's 70 degrees outside, it feels good. And then it starts to heat up. And that means the temperature is changing and you are detecting that temperature change through your skin. So air, you know, air that's around you has a specific heat. Uh, water has a specific heat. Now water, uh, being that it's so ubiquitous and everywhere, was used as kind of the depth, was used as a standard and was given a kind of a standard specific heat. And that specific heat of water is one, one calorie per gram degree Celsius. Now, we don't really use this value in our textbook. We use it in joules. And calories and joules are interrelated. Uh, 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. Those are equivalent to each other because one calorie, there's 4.184 joules. So anyway, the specific heat of a substance, you know, is can, it can be any substance. It can be gold, copper, iron, air, water, methanol, ethanol. It can be anything has a certain, a, a specific heat. It's specific to that substance. Your book has a table here, table 6-2, that shows some specific heats of some common substances. Now heat capacity, on the other hand, um, is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of a given amount or quantity of the substance by one degree Celsius. So specific heat and heat capacity are related. Uh, now the formula for those, uh, uh, mathematically, this guy is, heat capacity, and heat capacity is mass times specific heat. Now remember specific heat is a has units of uh, joules per gram degree Celsius, whereas mass has the unit of grams. So when we do this multiplication, our, our heat capacity, which is this big C, is now has a unit of joules per degree Celsius. So that's the amount of heat uh, required to raise the temperature of a, you know, by one degree Celsius, but it's a given quantity. So heat capacity has had the mass part taken out of it. And how I look at that is if I have a teeny tiny cup of coffee and I have a really big cup of coffee, this is a mug, by the way. If I have a little teeny tiny cup of coffee, the heat capacity of the large mug is going to be larger just because there's more water in it and water has a certain specific heat. So heat capacity is, is, has the mass term taken out of it. However, for determining the amount of heat that includes the specific heat part of it, we're going to use this formula called Q equals MS delta T. You might have heard it called Q equals M cat because some books will use a C here for this. 
That's okay too. Just recall that this is a lowercase c. So then you can use your Q here. Now Q is in joules. M is in mass and grams. Specific heat is in joules per gram degree Celsius and delta T is in degree Celsius. So when we have these different formulas, they are explaining how heat is interconverted between substances. So let's think about if I have a certain amount of water in grams, I know the specific heat of that water, and I have a temperature change that is affected upon that water, I can determine how much heat in joules that water has either absorbed or lost. So let's do a quick example here. Um, as far as iron, now it's kind of scary, this guy's up here welding on a very high, looks high, on a bridge maybe. How much heat is given off when a certain amount of iron cools from 94 to 5? So you think you have, here's a chunk of iron. We know its mass and we know it cooled down. And if it cooled down, that means heat was being radiated off of it. How much heat was that during that delta T or change in temperature? So we can use our relationship that Q equals MS delta T. Now we have to know S of iron. Iron uh, has the capability of uh, either absorbing 4.444 joules per one gram to raise it one degree Celsius or it'll lose that amount. Remember, it's either absorbing the positive and negative thing here is not as important. It's a specific heat. That just means that's how much energy it can absorb or give off to change its temperature. So our change in temperature for this example is negative 89 degrees Celsius because it cooled down. We plug those numbers in, look at all our, how our units are canceling properly. We end up with a negative 34,000 joules. So the question is how can you have a negative energy and what does that mean? That means that system lost energy. Remember, if we're doing the change internal energy of the system, like we were doing previously, Q plus W, there's no work done here because there's no gas expansion or compression. So we don't have to worry about that. But our energy is negative because the system, which was the bar of iron, lost energy to the surroundings. And hence, you have a negative delta U. So your delta U in this case would be negative 34,000. Joules. That's the change in energy of the system. Okay. Now let's do another example about calorimetry. Now calorimetry, this was a the realm of physics for a long time, physicists, and it still is because, you know, but in chemistry, we try to understand materials. Now this picture that you're seeing here is a, a picture that is from the practice problem, but it's kind of the same idea. Now apparently I have all the information here for us to look at, but let's read the problem. There's a certain gram steel ball and it has, it's at a certain temperature. It's placed in a constant pressure calorimeter. So it'd be one of those cup calorimeters and there's 120 milliliters of water. Now recall that's 120 grams because the density of water is one gram per mil. Now this is not lead, this is steel and steel is mostly iron and it has a certain mass and that mass is not this one, it's 30.14 grams. And then the initial temperature of this is not, is 117.82 degrees Celsius. And then it's dropped in the water. And then the water was starting at 18.4 degrees, 0.44 degrees Celsius. So if you look at your scenario, you can see that when I drop this in, this hot piece of iron into here, it's gonna give off energy to the surroundings. And as it does that, the temperature of the, sur the surroundings, which is water, is going to increase. Now it's gonna increase kind of equal and opposite in nature. However much energy the steel loses, the water will gain. So that's why you see this Q of steel is equal to negative Q of water. They're equal and opposite in nature. Now, if you do these calculations, what is being set up here is that for however much energy the steel loses, the water gains, but I have to take into account the mass of the steel, the specific heat of the steel. Now, it looks like that's wrong. I thought that was iron. And this is iron, which was, it should be 0 0.444, but you know, these numbers, they're just different from different locations. So either way, close enough for us.
And now we don't know the final temperature of the steel, but we do know the initial temperature. And remember, delta T is final minus initial. Okay, and that's where we got that, and that's where we got this quantity down here. And when this occurs and it reaches equilibrium over here in our cup, here the final temperature is gonna be the same for, for both the water and the steel ball. Now the water started at 18.44 degrees. It's gonna heat up a little bit. The steel ball started at 117.82, and it's gonna cool down a lot. And the reason it cools down a lot, whereas the water only heats up a little bit, is because of the specific heats. It doesn't take much energy to change the temperature of, of a steel ball, but it does change, take a lot of energy to change the temperature of water, hence its high specific heat. So this type of calculation is meant to determine a final temperature. And then if you want to play around and put in this 21 degrees here and 21 degrees here and solve for the amount of heat energy, they should be the same number, just equal and opposite in sign. So as far as your fun sheet question, we have one like this. You have a certain sheet of gold and it has a certain mass. And then you have a certain sheet of uh, iron and it has a certain mass. And then they're put uh, close to each other. So say this yellow one is the gold and the uh, black one is the iron. And so they're put next to each other, but they have a certain temperature and different masses. So given the fact that uh, the gold um, is at a cooler temperature than the iron, it would make sense that the iron is gonna lose heat to the gold. Now they have a certain, they have different specific heats and those different, you have to go look up the specific heat of gold and the specific heat of iron. This one was 0 0.444, I remember that. Joules per gram degree Celsius. I think this one is uh, gold is lower and has a lower specific heat. So I ask you to draw a picture and say which one's getting warmer, which one's getting cooler, um, and so on. So I helped you with that here. And then on letter B, I just ask you to think about what will the final temperature be? Will it be an average of the two? Uh, if it was, what would it be? An average of the two temperatures. So take the average of the two temperatures and show that. And then we're going to go to the next slide and, and see what's being asked next of this problem. So this is a, re you know, a reiteration of the problem. But now the question is to set up that calculation to determine the final temperature of the combined uh, metals using that law of conservation of energy, which is where the Q of the iron must be equal and opposite to the Q of the gold. And that's that example problem that you saw earlier. And see what the final temperature is based upon the, the different masses and the different specific heats. So after you do that, once you find the T final from this part, then you can list the delta T for each chunk of metal and look at why they're different. And then you can use Q equals MS delta T to calculate the amount of Q or heat uh, that was exchanged for each individual. And they should be equal and opposite in magnitude. If they aren't, you made a mistake somewhere in your calculations. You wanna go back and look at that. So what we were just covering was uh, metals and, and water and how heat moves between those systems. What we're going to look at now is a constant volume calorimetry where there's a constant volume container. Remember I was talking about the cookie. You just put your cookie in here and you burn it. And as you, you ignite it and it, there's a change in temperature of the surrounding water. And by knowing the change in temperature of the surrounding water, you can backtrack it to the amount of energy given off by the burning of the cookie. So this is set up in such a way that the water is taken into account, the heat that the water absorbs, the heat that the bomb absorbs or the bomb calorimeter, the heat of reaction or the amount of heat that's given off by the reaction, and these should all equal the, the change in the heat of the system. So since that's true no, and no heat enters or leaves and we can, that we can assign the Q of the system to be zero, we can then solve for what we want, which is the heat given off by the reaction by tracking the amount of heat that the water absorbs and the amount of heat that the bomb calorimeter absorbs. Now bomb calorimeters, a lot of times they have a heat capacity written right on them and there'll be a number written on the side here that gives you the heat capacity of the calorimeter. And you can use that. Heat capacity is in joules 
Uh, remember per degree Celsius. So if you know the heat capacity and you know the, the change in temperature in degrees Celsius, you can figure out the amount of joules uh, that must have been exchanged during the chemical reaction inside the bomb. So anyway, to figure out the Q that the water is exchanging, you need your mass and your specific heat and your change in temperature. And for the bomb, you need the specific heat, the, I'm sorry, the heat capacity of the bomb calorimeter and the change in temperature. It needs to be the same number, right? for these delta Ts. And since it's at constant volume, we know that uh, there, it's not exactly equal, remember. So um, that's kind of a, a problem with these uh, using a constant bomb, but remember it is quite close. See, it's approximately. So it's good enough as far as how much is in your cookie, you know, as far as your cal calories. So let's do a quick example. We're using our bomb calorimeter again. I've got the picture down here again. And we take a certain gram of methanol and you burn it down in here. So you can put a liquid down in here and you mass it out so you know how much methanol you're putting in there. And the temperature of the water changes by a certain delta T. There's that 4.2 degrees Celsius. If you are given that the heat capacity of the bomb plus the water, see that's important. These are manufactured in such a way that the whole machine takes into account the metal that it's made of and the water that's in here and everything. And the only thing you have to measure is delta T. That's what the machine measures is delta T. If you, so the heat capacity of the bomb calorimeter is 10.4 kilojoules per degree Celsius. And you know the change in temperature. What we wanna to get to is what's the molar heat of combustion of methanol. So let's, let's start here. We know that that's the calorimeter. The heat capacity of the calorimeter was given as 10.4 kilojoules per degree Celsius. We know it rose by 4.2 degrees Celsius upon combustion of that methanol. So when we combust methanol, remember our combustion reaction is combining it with oxygen to make carbon dioxide and water. And when that happens, but that's on a per mole basis, we, what we just measured was a certain mass of methanol and we got a value. Now that value was 43.68 kilojoules, but that's not here yet. That's 43.68 kilojoules for 1.922 grams of methanol. So we wanna figure out how many moles of methanol that is, and then just convert, since we know kilojoules, we can go divide it by the number of moles to get kilojoules per mole. And that is the number that we would put right here. Now that's 728 uh, kilojoules per two moles of methanol, look at, the, look at the balancing of the chemical reaction, per two moles of methanol, per three moles of O2, per two moles of CO2, per four moles of H2O. Now is that positive or negative? We just calculated this, but should it be positive or negative? We have to apply a sign. Now that's a combustion reaction and combustion reactions give off heat. So it would be negative and it would be exothermic. So on your fun sheet, I have a question here that's similar, and I have this, I'm talking about everyone likes to watch magnesium being burned. And I have a video um, in your fun sheet, a link, and it's one of those uh, periodic table of videos people, and he does the burning of magnesium. It's extremely interesting. And I want you to go through thinking about um, if I burn magnesium, what would be my reaction uh, for it? And I ask you to write that reaction for part A. So you have magnesium, it's combustion, plus oxygen to give magnesium oxide. You're gonna to have to look up the chemical formula of magnesium oxide and the, um, I ask you to do it per half a mole of oxygen because it just makes our calculations a little easier. And that's okay to have a half a mole of O2 because a half a mole of O2 means one O is being reacted with magnesium. So when this burns, if you continue to read this problem, how much heat is given off? Given that the heat capacity of that calorimeter is a certain number, just like we did in the previous problem, if I burn a certain amount and I get a change in temperature, I can use that change in temperature and the heat capacity to determine the number of joules given off during that burning. That's, what being, that's what's being asked in part B. And then in part C, you're being asked on a per mole basis. Because remember in part B, the value in joules that you get here is for the 0 0.1375 grams, not for on a per mole basis. So down here, you want to convert that grams to moles and then take that, that joules that you got in part A, convert it to kilojoules, and then divide it by the number of moles 
that you calculated right here. Okay, now as far as constant pressure calorimetry, constant pressure is like a cup calorimeter and it's open to the atmosphere. And again, this is a reaction mixture and that mixture is aqueous. So your chemical reaction is occurring in an aqueous environment. And, re and if we recall that the system um, is equal to the water plus the calorimeter plus the reaction, no, if we assume that no heat enters or leaves because it's nicely insulated here in these, five, in these cups, then we can say that the, the heat of the reaction that's occurring in the water is equal to that heat that the water absorbs plus the heat of the calorimeter. Now the heat of the water is determined by the mass of the water times the specific heat of the water times the change in temperature that the water is feeling. And the Q of the calorimeter, again, is equal to the heat capacity of the calorimeter times the change in temperature. Now a lot of times we assume that the Q of the calorimeter is zero, but that's not true. But it's nice to assume that, especially if it's nicely insulated like styrofoam, and then the Q of the water ends up being equal to the Q of the reaction. And when, that, when, when you do determine the Q of the reaction, since it's at constant pressure, we can call it equal to the change in enthalpy of the reaction, which is what we're trying to figure out most of the time. So on your fun sheet number eight, I have a question here for you about um, mixing uh, aqueous solutions of hydrochloric acid and aqueous solution of HCl oh, of a certain molarity, and remember that's moles per liter, and a certain volume and then mixing it with 85 milliliters of a certain molarity of barium hydroxide in a constant pressure calorimeter of negligible heat capacity. Since it's negligible, that means when you figure out the Q of the water and how that changed, that's gonna be equal to the Q of the reaction. And that's the amount of energy that was exchanged during that reaction. So the initial, if you have an initial temperature of HCl and barium hydroxide, it's the same. Now there's a process that's occurring here and there's a lot going on in this problem. So as far as what, when you do a chemical reaction like this, you want to write the chemical equation. Now that chemical equation is HCl. Now this is AQ and then plus barium hydroxide. There's a lot going on in this problem here. Barium hydroxide and then that's going to make, remember this is a neutralization reaction. So the barium is gonna go with the chloride. So you have a salt plus water, but in order to balance this, we're gonna need two waters. And over here, we're gonna need two of these and one barium, there we go. So there's our chemical reaction. So when we mix these things together, there, this, the, the temperature of this solution was 18.24 degrees Celsius and the temperature of the other solution was 18.24 degrees Celsius. And then I mix them together. And when I mix them together, I'm asking you what's the final temperature of the solution? Now this is kind of backtracking because we're saying, well, I have two beakers, one beaker of hydrochloric acid, one beaker of barium hydroxide at certain temperatures, and I mix them together. A neutralization reaction by definition, go up to this problem here in the text, it's showing you that hydro, hydronium plus hydroxide to make water, there's a certain value for that, and it's negative 56.2 kilojoules per mole. So if you know that information, I can apply that number to what's happening in my example. Now, if I look at the net ionic equation, remember how we have spectator ions, the spectator ions here are barium and chloride. So what happened here is that hydronium from the hydrochloric acid reacted with two hydroxides. I'm making sure I'm keeping it balanced to make two waters. Now, if you look at this, this looks a lot like this one, and but it's multiplied by two. So if we did want to multiply it by two, we could multiply this number by two in order to get the enthalpy for that. But the question here is, what is the final temperature? How can we figure that out? Well, we would have to figure out how many moles of each individual that we actually mix together. 
Now there is some information given here. There's a molarity of the hydrochloric acid and a volume. The molarity of the hydrochloric acid and the hydroxide are the same. And the volumes are the same. It's 85 milliliters. So if we can know, remember when we have a volume, this is a molarity and a molarity. When we have a volume and a molarity, we can figure out the number of moles and for each of these. And if we figure out the number of moles of each of those, we can figure out how many moles of water must have been produced. And recall that the delta H of neutralization here is equal to negative uh, 56.2. So if we know that information, we can figure out the number of kilojoules that must have resulted from that combination. And recall, Q equals M is delta T. And delta T is T final minus T initial. And since that's the case, if from this information here we can figure out Q, we know the mass of the solution, 85 plus 85 is, what's that, 170 milliliters, and take that to grams, that should be 170 grams. Because remember, we're using, we're pretending it's water, because it is mostly water. So that means we're going to use the specific heat of water, 4.184 uh, joules per gram degree Celsius. And then we can figure out, we know the initial temperature was 18.24. So if we can use this information, how much I combined, and the heat of vapor, heat of neutralization to figure out the Q, then the only thing I'm missing is the T final. Now this is a tough one. I mean, there's a lot going on here. And that's why I've given you um, this, um, there's a site and in your run sheet, there's a link there. And it takes you to where you can set up the experiment. And I've included a screenshot right here. And that is where you can actually choose what you mix together. I can go to liquids down here and then I could choose hydrochloric acid. And then I can choose information about it. Like what is its molarity? What is its volume? Actually, I should go to solutions, I believe. If I go to solutions, that's where I can find the hydrochloric acid. And then I can put in molarity and volume. And then I can go to the next one and put in the other solution, which is barium hydroxide. And then you put in its molarity and its volume. And you also put in the starting temperatures. And then you can mix them together. And when you mix them together, it's going to undergo a reaction and it'll show you the final temperature. So that it reaches based upon the amounts that you put in. And that the fact that this is a neutralization reaction, which obeys this 56.2 kilojoules per mole. So go there and run the reaction and then see if your final answer, your final temperature agrees. And finally, uh, you can look at this table in your textbook, which shows the, there's that negative 56.2. There's that heat of neutralization. And that heat of neutralization is an exothermic reaction between an acid and a base. And then the flip side of that, you see, is the heat of ionization of water is the flip side of that. It's positive 56.2. So this table is some typical reactions measured at constant pressure, and it gives you the, their heat of, like heat of fusion, which is melting, heat of vaporization, which is boiling, uh, just for fun, just to give you those idea, uh, an idea of what those numbers would look like.